Hi, and welcome to this tutorial covering how to create a server client solution using TCP IP in C++ that allows multiple users to connect to a server and stream music. First of all, I would like to mention my webpage, jimmyjonsson84.me. I've got a lot of other tutorials covering graphics, OpenGL, and gaming techniques. The link to the repository where the music server project is available can be found here as well. Some of the solutions presented here are Linux specific, especially the server solution that uses a technique that is called forking. This is not available in Windows. The TCP IP stack used in the code is also Linux specific, though it would probably be quite simple to port that section over to support Windows as well. One last heads up is that some of the subjects covered in this tutorial could be considered moderately difficult. If you're brand new to programming or C++, you might find it a bit tricky. Let's start with formulating what it is we want to solve. We want to create a server that can support streaming music to multiple clients. We also want to create a client that can request and play back the streamed music from the server. We will start with expanding our problem definition for the client. The client needs to be able to support concurrently handling traffic from the server, playing music, and handling input from the user. Now let's start looking at the solution for the client. There are multiple ways to handle concurrency, but I have chosen to use threads. We could have tried to do our networking by registering functions that are called at some interval, and thereby eliminating the need for threads. But there is one problem with this approach, and that is connected to the fact that we will be doing synchronous networking. Therefore, we need to make blocking calls that check if we can read or send data from the network. These calls could therefore stall our program for whatever timeouts we set. The timeouts we use are short, but it would be enough to disturb the flow of our application making handling the user input part sluggish. Another way we could have solved this is by switching to asynchronous network code or non-blocking sockets. The pros and cons of the different styles is a whole separate subject of its own, but I've chosen synchronous networking using polling because it's fairly efficient and it's easy to understand and work with. We will use a thread for handling network traffic. We will also have a thread that acts upon the incoming packets. The primary reason for having this running in a thread is that we want to be able to push as much of the music content to the memory as fast as we can without stalling handling the user input. We could try to handle this in a single thread as well, for example, by having a function that is called on some interval that we specify, or by processing the packets in the main loop. With this approach, if there is a lot of network traffic, for example, when the music content is being sent over, there could be long periods of times when all we do is process music data and the user won't be able to interact with the application. This is where threading shines, as it allows us to, with relative ease, provide a seamless experience for the application user, where all these things happen simultaneously. I've chosen Yeklang to handle playing music. This library is free to use for non-commercial projects, platform independent, as well as lightweight and simple to use. I will not cover the audio library or how to use it in this tutorial. There are plenty of good tutorials on the Eklang website explaining how to use it. We will focus on the server client solution and how to use the audio library to stream music. The user input will be taken care of in the main thread of the client application. Something that we will need to solve for both the client and the server is serialization. TCP IP requires us to transform our data into byte data in order to transfer it back and forth between the client and the server. A common technique is to describe the data using XML, and that works pretty well for some applications. However, XML does come with some costs. It uses a lot of memory for metadata, and it can be quite slow to transform it to and from XML. Since we will create an application that will be streaming back live music, we want to stay lightweight. 
I've chosen to serialize data in binary format and have specific code written that transform the binary data from and to the data structures used in the client and the server. This works well for our purpose as we have quite a small protocol to support. One of the costs of this approach is that it will require you to write code for each type of message that you want to handle, which can scale poorly if you need to support a growing amount of message types. There is a pretty good simple description of some of the pros and cons of different types of approaches to serialization described in the link to Google's protocol buffers. Google Protocol Buffers is a set of tools and libraries that you can use to serialize data. Here is a schematic overview of the client. The blue boxes are data structures that the client works with. We got streaming music, which is a structure with data needed to store and playback the music that the client receives from the server. Packet is a structure used to receive and send data over the network. It can tell the client what type of message it received. The actual data load is stored in an array of bytes. Client session is a structure that stores all the information used by the client. This includes an array of packets that we received from the network, as well as a streaming music object with the music that we are going to play. The client session also holds the name of the song we request to play, as well as the cover art we display when playing a song. The client application, which is the yellow box at the bottom, is made up of three threads. The first thread, called network, deals with the TCP IP stack. It checks for incoming traffic to the client and also sends any packets that the client wants to send to the server. The second thread, handle packets, acts upon the incoming packets from the server. Here we print the cover art and feed the music that we receive from the server to the audio system. The third thread, main, is the main thread of the program. Here we take care of the user input. We let the user specify which server to connect to and deal with the song requests as well as let the user decide if he wants to exit. In order to support serving multiple concurrent clients, we will use something called forking which is a platform-specific functionality available on Linux. When you call fork, you get a new child process, which is a duplicate of the parent process. The child process continues executing right after the fork call, and so does the parent as well. Fork returns the process ID. In the child process, the fork call always returns zero making it possible to determine what code should be executed in the child process and what the parent process should do. We will use this to make the child process handle the song request and anything else that the client wants to do. The only job of the parent process in our server is to wait for further incoming connections and then spawn a child process for the new client once it has been connected. Forking is similar to multi-threading and can be quite handy when doing something like this. It can, however, be more memory consuming as it will duplicate data for the new child process. The child process gets a new duplicated memory array of the parent process. The server is a bit less complex than the client. There will be one parent process constantly waiting for new connections and then a number of child processes running to serve clients that are connected to it. The child processes continuously wait for song requests, since this is all that the client can do, ask for a song. Once a song request is received, the cover art is sent, followed by the music. If we receive a request from the client to exit the session, we terminate the child process. Before we dive into the code, let's talk briefly about the TCP IP and how we use the different sets of APIs available to us. TCP IP uses a concept called socket, which is a handle that we can use to send and receive data through. It supports bidirectional communication. In other words, we can both send and receive data using a socket. A simple way to think of a socket is to think of it as a telephone. You dial a number and wait for someone to pick up. Once the person you call has answered, you can both hear 
or receive and then talk or send to each other. We will be using the transmission control protocol, which is what TCP stands for. TCP guarantees that if you send data, that data will reach the socket you sent it to, as long as the connection doesn't die. If a packet of data is lost on the way, TCP will try to resend it again and keep track of this for us. This comes with some downsides as well. If a packet is lost, a common technique is to lower the speed that data is transferred. There are other faster protocols, such as the UDP, that delegates the job of assuring that data being sent actually arrive at the client to the application itself. We will not be exploring that in this tutorial though. Let's have a quick look at the functionality we will be using to send and receive data. If we use the telephone analogy again, connect is similar to what happens after you've dialed a number. You specify the person you want to connect to or call, and you're now waiting for that person to answer. Except is similar to hearing the phone ring and answering it on the other end. Once the connection is established, you can now start sending data. That is done using read and send. We will use synchronous sockets, which means that a call to either read or send are blocking. In other words, the code that calls read or send could stall while waiting for something to read from the socket or for the send buffer to be freed up so something can be sent. While we do use threads to handle communications, we don't want either the server or client to stall trying to read or send something, as that could prevent the clients or the server from sending something we put in the send queue or read something back from the socket. Because we will take care of both reading and sending in the same thread, so therefore we will use a function called pull, which we can sort of use to poke the socket and see if there is anything to read from it before we try and read it or poke to see if the send buffer is full before we try to send something. Let's start with looking at the client. We can see that we create a client session data object as we mentioned before. We also use a bool, client running, which we use to later on inform our two threads if we want them to exit. Client running is an atomic object, which is one of the synchronization concepts used in threads. Since we have three different threads that could all manipulate or read our bool, we need to make sure that only one thread at a time can operate on the bool. If not, we could partially modify this variable in one thread and then start reading it in another thread. This would obviously be bad and could lead to undefined behavior. We will see some more examples of this using mutex later on. We then initiate the audio system. After that we let the user specify the server he wants to connect to and then try to connect to the server using client connect to server. In client connect to server we see some of the detail that goes into making the connection. We create a socket, fill out a sock adder in structure where we specify the address and port we want to connect to. Then finally we call connect and wait for the server to accept our connection. After that we let the user specify which song he wants to listen to. Then we create a request song packet. Here we can see what goes into creating a song request packet. We specify a packet type and we perform the serialization. In this case that is simply copying the string we created. Next, we put it on the send queue, so that once we start our thread that handles sending and receiving, our song request will be sent to the server. Here we can see that we use the mutex. Since there are no threads started yet, this is not required, but for further calls it is needed. Now we are starting our first thread, the network thread. This thread will start instantly and will execute the code in the handle packets function. Inside handle packets, we see that we will run a loop until the user decides to terminate the program. In the loop, all we do is check if there is a new packet to read 
or if we got packets to send. If we got a packet to read, we simply put it in our array of incoming packets. Here we use a mutex. A mutex has two functions we can use, lock and unlock. If another thread already called lock, our lock call will simply block and wait until the mutex become available. The reason we need to use a mutex is that we will be working on our C++ vector. Manipulating it is not guaranteed to be thread safe, so we use a mutex to make sure that no other thread is currently working on the vector. Lock guard will call lock in the constructor and then unlock in the destructor once it goes out of scope. This simply makes it easier to be sure we don't forget to make the appropriate lock unlock call in our code. The send code is just the same thing, but here we send packets on the send list and then remove them from that list. Let's have a quick look at the receive packet and send packet function as well. I won't go into details here, but let's brush through the code. Starting with receive packet. First, we make a call to poll where we specify that we want to check for incoming traffic, poll in, and that we are willing to wait a maximum of 50 milliseconds before we time out. Next, we try to read from the socket into our buffer, data received. We want to read the whole packet, so we specify the packet size, total packet size. If there was anything to read, it means there is a packet to read, either all of it or at least parts of the packet. A call to read is not guaranteed to give us all the data we requested. If we didn't get the entire packet, we make subsequent calls to read until the whole packet has been received. This can easily be seen if you're running a real-world case with a server on a different machine than the same one you're running your client on. If you run the server and the client on the same machine, chances are the connection is so fast you will never see this happen though. After the whole packet has been received, we simply transform the byte data and data received to our packet structure. Send packet is very similar to receive packet. Here we instead request poll to look at outgoing, pull out. If we can call send without a block, we serialize the packet into the data send buffer and simply send it. Okay, so now let's get back to the client code again. We now start the second thread, process packets received. This function is a bit bigger. Let's have a look at it in a separate slide. This thread will loop until the user decides to end the program. Here, we act upon the incoming traffic. If we receive a packet with the cover arc in it, we buffer it up until we receive a cover arc end packet. Then we print it in the terminal. To handle the music, the first thing we will get is a music size packet, which simply tells us how big the audio file is. We need to know this so we can allocate the appropriate amount of memory for the audio system. After that, we will get a series of music stream packets that contain the binary data of the audio file. These are copied into the memory area we gave to the audio system. Once a certain amount of music data has been received, we tell the audio system to start playing the music. Then we continuously copy new data received from the server into the memory area until all music data has been copied. Now let's look at the main loop that handles user input. This is what the main thread does. We simply wait for the user to either request a new song or to quit. If the user wants a new song, a new song request packet is created and put on the send queue. Once we exit, we send a disconnect packet, allowing the child process that served the client to exit. And finally, let's have a look at the server. The first thing we do is call signal, which has to do with the child processes the service will be creating. This simply allows the child process to die off once they have finished executing. If we don't specify the SIG IGN or ignore signal, the parent process could want to process what happened to a child process that died. This isn't something we will want to do. By specifying ignore, the child process can die off immediately after they are finished executing. Next, 
we create a socket that we can use to accept incoming connections to. Here we have the main loop of the server. The parent process runs the outer loop, a loop that simply waits for a new incoming connection at server wait for client to connect. After that, we call fork, which creates a child process. The child process runs the inner loop, where we process incoming song requests and then send the appropriate cover art and music data. All right, it's demo time. I've pre-built the server on a cloud server. I use DigitalOcean's Droplet server with the minimum specification, and it seems to be able to support quite a few clients without any performance issues. In case you want to try it out yourself, I could recommend trying uh, DigitalOcean out. And by the way, no, I am not endorsed by DigitalOcean. I just wanted to give an example of something that I have tested out myself. Let's start with running the server. As we can see, it is now waiting for a client to connect to it. Now let's fire up a client. We see that the audio system is initiated and we are now asked for the server address. If we jump back to the server, we can now see that the client has joined. The parent process has accepted the new client. And we can also see that the child process has been started. And we also see that the parent process is now waiting for another client to join. Okay, let's ask for a song. So the cover art has been sent to us, as well as the music, which is now playing. Let's have a look at what's happening on the server side. Okay, we can see that the, the server has received the song requests and uh, sent the cover art and the music size and then the actual music itself. Let's try starting a second client. now connected to it. Let's see what happens on the server. Okay, now we can see again that a new client has joined, so a new child process has been spawned and is running. Let's ask for a, uh, let's just stop the music here first and then let's jump over here and ask for a second song the second client. Uh, this song is a bit larger, so we should be able to see that the server is actually sending it here. So we see on the server here that the size has been sent, but the whole file has not been transferred yet. And you can see it will print out when the whole file has been sent. Okay, now the whole file has been sent. Okay, that's it for the demo. This was a long one. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider leaving a like or subscribe. If you have any questions or feedback, I would love to hear from you in the comment section. Again, thanks for taking the time to watch and listen.